We're happy to be co-hosting this forum with Ray Jazer of Energy 21. Our mission at the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund is to educate, engage, and empower New Yorkers to be effective advocates for the environment. We equip voters with information about climate and sustainability issues and encourage them to hold candidates accountable to their promises. As you know, Cortland and Tompkins County face environmental issues on a daily basis. From aging water infrastructure, to access to renewable energy and clean transportation, to water quality protection, especially from harmful algal blooms and invasive species control. Luckily, this district has been well served for more than a decade by Assemblymember Barbara Lifton. She's been a longtime champion for the environment, calling for stricter regulation of fossil fuels and securing state funding for water infrastructure. And she took it even further, introducing and helping to pass bills that protect water resources uh, and protecting our communities from the spread of aquatic invasive species and testing for lead in public water sources. We wanna make sure that the assembly member who follows in Barbara's, Barbara Lifton's footsteps continues to keep the environment a top priority. That's why we're holding this forum tonight, to make sure the environment is top of mind for both candidates and voters. Climate change is a continuing reminder that our actions affect the environment and what happens when we don't work to advocate for it. So thank you again for all being here. You're helping us to send a message that New Yorkers care about having a healthy environment, a livable climate for future generations, and are paying attention during this primary election. I wanna thank our valuable partners who help spread the word about this forum. The Climate Reality Project, Energy 21, Heat Smart Tompkins, Mothers Out Front, Sustainable Tompkins, and the Sierra Club. Because this is a virtual forum, let me go over some of the ground rules before we start. You in the audience should all have your sound muted so you don't disturb the flow. We recommend that you watch the forum in speaker view instead of gallery view so you can better see the person who is speaking. We'll start with one minute opening statements from each candidate. Our moderator will proceed with some questions and we'll even throw in a lightning round of short yes or no type questions. Emphasis on short. We'll end with audience questions. Please make sure you submit your questions through the chat feature to the participant marked questions before 6.30. Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator. Tom Pudney is the managing editor of the Ithaca Voice, an online news publication. Before joining the Ithaca Voice, he spent time as managing editor at the Legislative Gazette and as an intern at Politico New York, covering the governor's office and the state legislature. He graduated in 2017 from SUNY New Paltz Digital Media and Journalism Department. So welcome, Tom. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I love when we get into the part of campaigning that is specific policies and environmentalism is one in New York 125 that is particularly important. So I'm excited to hear everybody break out of their comfort zone of just campaigning and talking points and have to dig down on an important issue in our district. Uh, so we're going to start with candidates opening statements. Everybody is going to get one minute. Uh, we're going to just go in the order that I was given by NYCLV. Uh, and we're going to start with Anna Kells. You have one minute for your opening statement. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having us here tonight. Um, for people who don't know my background in environment, my undergrad my graduate degree was environmental studies. Um, I was then a guide in the Amazon jungle where I worked with indigenous communities on permaculture farms and eco ecotourism. Um, I came back to the United States and after finishing my PhD came home. I was a defender of uh, Seneca Lake arrested with a group of mothers on Mother's Day. We were there actually multiple days. Um, I have been working in the field as, as an activist. I was the director of the Green Resource Hub. Um, since joining the legislature in 2015, I have been the chair of planning energy and environmental quality. I have fought for things like, um, fought against the TPP, um, a trash incinerator on, on Cuga Lake, um, fought also to not have the uh, power plant repowered. Um, I have a 10 point plan that I'm happy to share with you all this evening. I'm sure we'll have the opportunity. Um, I have the experience, I have the passion, I'm looking forward to this and certainly getting to Albany. Thank, Thank you. you. Anna. Bo Harbin, you are next up, one minute. Great, thank you. Good evening for the opportunity to speak with everyone tonight. As was mentioned, my name is Bo Harbin. I'm a Cortland County legislator and minority leader in Cortland. 
I believe in peer-reviewed science, which is why I believe in man-made climate change and the need for transformative advances like the Restore, Restore Mother Nature Bond Act to counter its impacts before it's too late. We have seen with this pandemic that progress, while hard, is not impossible. It is time to make investments as a key part of our recovery, and we can make a difference, and I'm committed to seeing this happen. I'm proud of my record of advancing a pro-environment agenda, even in the face of regular opposition, leading Cortland County on climate change impacts, fighting for renewable energy projects in our community, and more. As a fellow with the Appalachian Leadership Institute, I work with others across the region, but always push back against the clean coal myth. I highlight the leadership of New York in banning fracking, even though it's a standard practice across Appalachia. Furthering a pro-environment future will continue to be my primary focus in Albany. Thank you. Great, Jordan Lesser, you're up next, one minute. Yes, hey everyone. You know, much of my political uh, and legal career has been one of deep, deep commitment to the environment. That uh, begins with when I worked as a national park ranger and then went to law school and to get an environmental law degree. Uh, after that, I came back to my hometown of Ithaca and I reached out to our current assemblywoman, Barbara Lifton, and I've been there with her for every step of the way for the last 10 years with success after success in Albany for every major environmental issue the state's faced. This includes the hydrofracking battle. I authored a uh, brief for the uh, Dryden lawsuit to make sure that uh, we could ban uh, fracking locally. Uh, dozens of, of letters that had dozens of assembly members sign on to push for a health impact study. Uh, I've been there at the table uh, drafting and negotiating the Aquatic Invasive Species Bill. Uh, including this year's Bond Act, uh, securing 700 million in climate uh, mitigation monies going forward. I've worked with many advocacy groups over the years, and I have a very deep commitment. I can hit the ground running immediately, and I'm the best person to tackle climate change going forward. Thank you, Jason. Lisa Hoshul, you're up next. Jordan, Jordan. Oh, Sorry, Jordan. Hi, thank you very much for this uh, forum this evening. As a New Paltz graduate where I met my husband, this is really exciting to, to see you in person. Um, you know, I've been a public servant for my entire career and you can't know everything about every issue, but I've been fascinated to read um, your New York State policy agenda and agree with everything that you have in terms of your top priorities, congestion pricing, climate change, clean transportation, food waste, but I think on the local level, one of the most important aspects of your policy priorities is recycling. With China closed to recycling, it's going to be really hard for us to figure out what to do with our waste. We want to continue to do that. Our Portland County Legislature has actually, certainly not Bo, but other members of the legislature have actually advocated to stop re recycling because we can't make money on it. I think those are the types of supports that we need to provide to local uh, legislatures to help them figure out what to do with their recycling waste to make sure that they can actually continue to help us keep the environment clean. And I look forward to being able to have a really robust conversation today. Thank, Thank you. you, Lisa. The actual Jason, Jason Leifer, you're up next. One minute. Thanks, Josh. Um, so thanks for having all of us. I've been uh, working to protect the local environment in New York State since 2008 when I joined the Dryden Town Board, working on everything from open space and farmland protection with the Finger Lakes Land Trust and local farmers in New York State, to banning fracking, um, which became state precedent. I was on the ground with the Dryden Resource Awareness Coalition, who this election endorsed me. It's the first time I've ever endorsed anybody in an election, in part because of that. Um, since then, we've permitted uh, utility-sized solar in the town, 30 megawatts. Um, that's benefiting everybody, and I buy my power from that. We've also become a climate-smart community. Um, we are putting in EV charging stations. We require green building for all new multifamily housing. I've helped with Mothers Out Front. We, we got Dominion to reduce emissions at the Dominion Borger Power Station. Um, we've been working to map our well water and, and protect Cuga Lake with aquifer protection and groundwater protection in Dryden. Uh, it's, it's been you, my pleasure for, to do this for years, and I've been doing the work on the ground um, for the Seth entire Seth Murtaugh, you're up next. One minute. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks to everyone for organizing this. It's a great pleasure to be here to talk to you tonight. Uh, my name is Seth Murtaugh. I'm an eight-year member of the Ithaca Common Council and a five-year member of Assemblywoman Barbara Lifton's staff. 
At the local level in my service in Common Council, I've been a champion for affordable housing, for walkable neighborhoods, and for sustainable development. When it comes to environmental policy for the state, I think one of the biggest challenges we face right now in Albany is that with everything that's going on with the coronavirus, the fallout with the state, the financial impacts, there is a real risk that there's going to be pressure to put our environmental goals on the back burner. And I think we've already seen examples of this. You know, just this year, Governor Cuomo actually proposed offloading some DEC personnel salaries onto the Environmental Protection Fund. I think it's going to be incredibly important to push back in the months ahead and in the years ahead on those types of efforts and to stand up for the environment and for our climate goals as codified last year in the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And I think the New York League of Conservation Voters has an enormous role to play in that. I think it's important that you're out there fighting on the front lines. And I want to thank you again for organizing. Thank you, sir. Let's see. Donna Gibson. Hi, everybody. It is my great honor and pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you. I um, have been an activist in, in environmental work my whole life, really. I uh, am a lawyer uh, and have definitely sat on many committees in my role on the women's board, where I'm, uh, um, I sit as a board member. I'm on many committees where we draft legislation and work on legislation on the environment. Um, but I like to say that uh, my experience bucking the system is actually more relevant in this moment on the environment. I represent th hundreds of, uh, of climate activists in many different movements. I was the lead attorney for the VR Seneca Lake, where 657 arrests, that I mostly defended all of them later, and several years of hard work later, we were able to stop the plan to make the Finger Lakes the fracked gas hub of the Northeast. I actually teach a class at Cornell Law School, teaching law students how to defend climate activists and other activists. I'm passionate about this. Um, change is going to have to be made as we go forward um, from the outside and the inside, and I want to be there. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We are a little behind schedule, so we're going to go right into question one. Many environmentalists are enthusiastic about the potential for action on climate change to create new green jobs. What would you do to ensure that green jobs are being created in this district? Let's start back at the top of the list with Anna Kells. You have one minute. Yeah, I think that, um, thank you for as asking this question. I think it's really important. Um, NYSERDA actually has four um, pots of funding right now specifically to increase the jobs within the energy sector workforce development, internships, um, transitioning jobs, specifically focused on disadvantaged populations, um, in particular, um, uh, environmental justice communities, veterans. Um, I think that those need to be uh, um, focused on. We need to bring those jobs into this area. Another area that is already one of our central cores is agriculture. There is money in the state budget that was not cut specifically in uh, climate resilient fund as well as farmland protection. I think that it's really important that we prioritize small farmers transitioning to conservation agriculture and cooperative agriculture in this area. So I think those are clear things that we could bring to this area quickly. Bo Harbin, you're up next, one minute. This is a, an, excellent, uh, an excellent question because the green jobs um, are really gonna fuel our uh, recovery out of the COVID crisis. Um, on my work on the Southern Tier 8 Regional Planning Board where I'm Vice Chair, we've looked at this in a number of different areas and working with the Appalachian Regional Commission. I'm bringing in grant fundings for workforce development. Um, we've been working with uh, small manufacturers to help kickstart our manufacturing process in the area of battery generation um, and others which will help uh, you know, do the storage needed for these new green uh, energy and renewable solutions. We've also been uh, working hard to help uh, support local businesses like Dragon Solar here in Portland uh, who put the solar panels on our own roof. We'll be able to see that across our district as we, as we continue to move forward. We have to continue these, the incentives from New York State to uh, support individuals and in moving forward with these local uh, groups. The other uh, area that Barbara Lifton has really been a champion of and I wanna continue is the winterization program. We can get people to work very quickly in winterizing our uh, old housing stock. Thank you. Jordan Lesser, you're up next, one minute. Yes, thank you. I, you know, I have been 
uh, there alongside Assemblywoman Lifton developing that exact weatherization program that Bo's speaking about. You know, this is something I will continue to push in Albany. I know how we can take the money now from the Clean Energy Fund and, and roll out good paying jobs to reduce emissions, not only here in the district, but across the state. Uh, you know, another thing we've seen, uh, particularly in Cortland, that's been lost greatly over the last few decades is uh, our manufacturing base. So, you know, we have a lot of great R&D here at our universities and apply that towards uh, our, our development of storage technology. I know there's a battery uh, company already existing in times. You know, they say this is not future technology about realistic uh, storage, battery storage for renewable energy, that this is available now. I will work to incentivize uh, their production. This is the, something we can roll out across the state and have uh, training programs for installing renewable technology run through uh, TC3 and BOCES. Thank you, Jordan. Lisa Hoshul, one minute. So this is where we can really focus on uh, partnering with Tompkins Courtland Community College and making sure that we're creating new opportunities for uh, young people to investigate economic development through green technology. And I think that that's where funding needs to be focused. Um, the bottom line is I'm, I'm terrified at the idea that because oil has become cheap, that we will immediately go back to our non-green technology, our technologies around oil, and, and lose all of the focus that we have, have started to garner. I think it's very important that we fund the workforce and, and really invest in TC3 and other community colleges so we can create green trades and green opportunities for individuals who are um, looking to find new career opportunities in the green technologies. And TC3 is really a great asset. We need to really focus on that. Thank you. Jason Lee for one minute. So I, I agree we need to use TC3, but we also need to use BOCES to you know, train young people in working on uh, in, in trades like HVAC, which are important when you, when you install um, heat pumps, not only in all new homes, but in older homes as well. Um, weatherization is local, creates local jobs. It's uh, rehabbing older homes. Uh, we also need to continue building out our renewable energy infrastructure and upgrading the grid. That's going to require, you know, close work with our electrical unions. Um, and every time that there's a project that's uh, given you know, credits or, or funding from the state, whether it's through an I, a local IDA or a state grant, we need to make sure that the jobs are first going to local workers, not out of state workers. Um, that's not always a priority and our IDAs oftentimes fail on that, including our local one. And green building codes, of course, whether it's encouraging local municipalities to adopt them or, or adopting a statewide one to help with the municipalities that have a much different political climate than the local ones here in the 125th. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Sujata Gibbs, oh, skipped one. Seth Murtaugh, one minute. So if, if we're gonna meet the goals of the CLCVA, um, which are quite ambitious, um, we are gonna have to have a massive transition uh, in the building sector uh, from fossil fuels to electric heating systems, so heat pumps. Um, you know, right now, if your furnace breaks, you, you know, you probably call the furnace person, but people don't think that they could call the heat pump person, and we need more heat pump people. We need to change the culture, and part of changing that culture is creating a career path, a visible career path that people know that they can get trained and they can do these jobs. In some cases, these jobs, um, you know, it doesn't take six years of a PhD to learn them, but they pay well, and they're intellectually stimulating, and uh, you can put people to work right away. So I agree with what everybody has said about leaning on TC3. I think support for our community college is more important than ever. I think creating a green technology uh, workforce development track at TC3 is important. Also, I agree with what Jason said about BOCES, and I'd also add, um, you know, our school school districts as well in, included include our school districts in that as well. So um, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Sujata Gibson, one minute. So I think that, uh, you know, part of this question has to do with what are green jobs. Um, I think we're going to need to really uh, nail down some priorities. My priorities are food sustainability. I think we're really vulnerable right now with climate change coming to the massive food shortages we, uh, we must expect uh, that are on the way. I think 
we could be giving local governments, uh, you know, a pot of money each and, and having uh, certain goals to meet of hiring farmers and permaculture experts to come up with regional plans uh, for food uh, sovereignty uh, that would in, then put people to work, you know, doing the, putting in that infrastructure, the community greenhouses, digging up the lawns and making the victory gardens, putting in permaculture food for us. Other ones are, of course, weatherization is a big priority for me. That would be more of a statewide effort and then the local governments would control it. And also small grid electrical systems that are more resilient and geothermal. But for those, we're gonna have to put provisions on there that there's prevailing wage and local labor. Otherwise, we're, they're just gonna keep going to unsustainable companies that don't employ local people. All right, question two. Some of you have already- um, Can I ask a quick question, Tom? I'm sorry to bother you, but I, I, I've lost Claire in my main screen. I don't know if anybody else has. I'm having trouble seeing her. You can find her tile and click on the three dots in the upper right corner. You can pin her in your screen. That's all right, just checking. Trying to do that, but it's not letting me. Okay, I'll just figure it out. Don't worry about it, keep going. I don't want to take any more, any more time from anybody else. Go ahead. A few of you have already touched on the, uh, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, and as Seth mentioned, it, it sets some ambitious goals for New York to have 100% clean energy by 2040 and be 100% carbon neutral by 2050. Further legislation will undoubtedly be required in the years to come to help meet these goals. What further legislation would be required to help New York achieve these climate goals? And we'll start again at the top with Anna Kells. Sure, I'm happy to start again, although I do not see any starter or timer or anything. So before I start, I have the same problem that Lisa does. Claire, can you unmute yourself for a moment so that you can become more visible to her folks? Yes, if she speaks, she should pop up to the top. Does everyone see me now? No. So then I... Keep um, talking, Claire. The three dots, if you click them, and then you should be able to pin my screen, my video to your screen. Or sometimes you have to double click her box if you don't see the three dots. Okay, I just I think I got you. I got you. So then three dots. Okay, I'm moving it. All right. Uh, you're still on the second screen and I'm in the first, but now I'm moving. I think it will move you over. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you, can you repeat the question, Tom? Uh, the CLCPL sets the ambitious goal of New York having 100% clean energy by 2040 and 100% carbon neutral by 2050. Obviously, further legislation will be needed. What further legislation would be required to help New York achieve these climate goals? Well, I think some people have touched on this. There, the, the thing that I think we all need to recognize is when we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions, we need to identify the biggest contributors. And right now, in the estimates in New York State, the biggest contributors are buildings and transportation. So to make that biggest transition quickly, um, instead of waiting for the CLCPA task force to give their recommendations, which won't come out for the earliest about two years from now, we need to focus on that weatherization bill that absolutely needs to be first. Tax credits, tax incentives specifically need to be put in place for that. Um, so that's the first. Um, and then the second is transportation. So specifically upgrading our, our, um, our infrastructure so that we can have electric and electric buses, electric cars throughout our entire grid. Right now, it's very hard to drive anywhere with an electric car long distance. That infrastructure needs to be in place. Mass transportation is another huge component, but electrifying that and electrifying the grid. Um, lastly, I'll say renewable energy generation, of course, is key with energy energy storage as well to feed into that grid in order to support those systems. So that as a whole yeah. package is really important. Bo Harbin, you have one minute up next. Jordan Lesser, you are up after. Bo. Sure, thank you. And there are a number of things that are going to have to, to follow on. Um, we're going to have to significantly expand um, our solar uh, energy. Uh, we need to move forward on the uh, site uh, plan uh, unification. Uh, we need to look at Hydro, uh, we need to increase, we need to be able to utilize, without building uh, hydro dams, be able to utilize the power of our river systems. Uh, we need to look at innovative solutions like we see in Portland and other cities, where as they're replacing their aging water infrastructure, they're actually adding water turbines into their infrastructure system to do clean energy, re uh, 
uh, clean energy and generation. I've already touched on the, the battery development uh, initiatives that we see. But also one of the things with our farmers, we need to look at the anaerobic digester systems. Uh, the assembly bill uh, A2283 will provide incentives for our farmers, which are throughout our, uh, New York State, to do stuff with their waste that will um, help take care of the waste products, but also to uh, provide clean energy solutions. So we need to look at a whole tier of different solutions. Thank you. Jordan Lesser, you are up. Lisa Hoshel, you are up next. One minute. Yeah, uh, yes. You know, uh, I, I very much agree with the things that have already been said, that the two largest sectors we need to tackle are transportation and building stock. So yes, initially, no one's going to adopt uh, electric vehicles unless it's actually a viable replacement for uh, gas powered vehicles. So what we need to do immediately is, you know, use uh, revenue from a uh, carbon fee to put this back into, first of all, uh, communities that have been disproportionately impacted from the effects of climate change. But secondly, use that to boost our infrastructure statewide. Uh, you know, we also need to look at lowering the Reggie cap, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. This is what sets the uh, threshold for how much each power plant can emit. We're in a regional collaborative where we can lower that every few years. This is coming up this year. Action we can take immediately before the Climate uh, Action Council's recommendations are finalized. And lastly, any economic development project that we have going forward must uh, make sure in law that it's compatible with our climate goals or it should not happen. Thank Thanks. you, Jordan. Lisa Hoshel, you're up next. Jason Lee for you after her. Thank you. So, you know, we have to recognize the social cost of carbon and we really have to look at taxing that, making that fungible. I think we need to be investing in um, ZEVs, zero emissions vehicles. I think that's very important because I think especially as we look at rural transportation opportunities, busing systems, public transportation systems should be looking at those types of opportunities to make sure that we're not creating more carbon a footprint every time we engage in public transportation. I have to say it's interesting that we are seeing, as we've all noticed, a decrease in the amount of emissions that um, are being emitted in the um, global environment right now. That should tell us something. Telecommuting and telehealth and as a result broadband is one of those strange little obvious notes that we should be investigating because more telehealth, more telecommuting, more telecommunications may mean fewer emissions in the environment and we should really be engaging in looking at out of the box thinking. It's not just about the emissions, but it's about the other things that impact emissions that we should be considering. Thank you. Jason Liefer, you're up next. Seth Murtaugh follows Jason Liefer. So one of the first things we should do is just stop importing fracked gas into New York State. I mean, there's a Williams pipeline that's talked about in uh, Brooklyn that, sh that should just be, uh, shouldn't happen. Um, it's, there's actually a, a hearing on the 11th of June that people should, if you're really opposed to fracked gas, then you should make a comment. I did today. Um, you need to have lower emission vehicles become the norm. The way to do that is to have producers of high emission vehicles pay for subsidies to increase the electrical vehicle fleet. That way we'll get more EV charging stations all over the state. So you can go from Buffalo to New York City um, by just charging up. You can take whatever, whoever's gonna make it, Tesla or whatever other company shows up. We need to imp increase our rural um, transportation networks and that's going to require, require some real thinking. Um, there's a company that I know and I talked to a few months ago that's thinking about coming to Tompkins County to have autonomous electrical vehicles that can work on demand. Because um, right now people don't use tr public transportation as much as they'd like to because it's not reliable, it's not compatible with you know, families that have kids and, and, and things like that. So there's a lot we can do and we should be doing all the things I just mentioned plus more. Thank you, Jason. Seth, you're up next. Sujuda, you're up after Seth. So uh, to bring down emissions in the transportation sector, I think we have to take uh, a regional approach, uh, like the Transportation and Climate Initiative. I think we have a great precedent for that in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. I think it made sense to work with neighboring states to partner with them on programs like a Cap and Invest program or to encourage the deployment of zero emission vehicles. 
I also think that to address uh, electric heating systems and to uh, encourage the transition to heat pumps, we need an energy efficiency law and it needs to be paired with a really robust incentive program. Uh, because heat pumps are expensive and when somebody's furnace breaks in the middle of winter, they might not have the wherewithal to think that they need to replace their furnace with heat pumps. You know, maybe like a cash uh, for boilers program. Um, and finally, we really need to reform the Article 10 siting process so we can ramp up the production of renewable energy in the state, uh, particularly wind and solar. Uh, and I think reforming that process, which has a lot of hurdles, a lot of burdens, uh, is going to be really critical uh, to dramatically increasing our renewable energy production in the state. Thank you. Sujata, you are up next. One minute. Hey, well, I echo what everybody has said. I think that the question was a little bit more specific about how to meet our clean energy, 100% clean energy goals, uh, not just emissions. So I'm going to focus there. I think what we need to do if we want to get to 100% clean energy is dramatically reduce the amount of energy we use because it's otherwise impossible no matter you know how many renewables uh, we can bring into the mix we've got to we've got to start a degrowth model so we can do the things like weatherizing our homes will certainly help and putting in community sized geothermal systems smaller uh, more efficient uh, electrical grids that can work with uh, you know and, and efficiency standards um, and incentive programs I agree with you Seth on that we're going to have to come up with uh, robust incentive programs for all of this. And we could, um, we should be looking at hydropower. We should be looking at maybe out of the box solutions like setting up more walkable, uh, not dense urban, but walkable farm-based village communities, more like an eco-village. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> Great, moving on to question three. I think we've also touched briefly on the Green New Deal. Uh, what do you see as the main challenge to realizing a Green New Deal in the 125th District, and how would you address that challenge? We are going to go with the same order for this question, and then after the lightning round, we will go in reverse order. So, Anna Callens, you have one minute. Um, so, I think that there, there absolutely are big challenges right now, specifically because we have we are coming out of a global pandemic, and I am concerned, as others are, that the issues that we really need to address will be cut and left behind um, in order to address that budget deficit. Um, there are things that can be put in place, specifically like um, income tax uh, um, that we've all talked about, and Wall Street loopholes closing those, um, borrowing at a zero interest from the federal government. Those things need to be put in place and those investments need to be made in the community. Um, and specifically, I would say it's important that we partner with community colleges, BOCES high school programs in order to do workforce development. That is the number one thing we absolutely need. There is an in, there's a in, in, inadequate number for workforce development to implement a lot of the things that we're talking about, the renewable energy, the transportation, upgrading our grids, that is absolutely key and we need to do that specifically in communities that have been disadvantaged by the current system that we have in place. Thank you. Bo Harbin, you are up next, followed by Jordan Lesser. Well, the Green New Deal is a great vision for where we need to be headed as a country um, and as a world um, as we come out of this uh, pandemic and as we start to really fight the impacts of climate change. Um, there's a lot that we can be doing uh, we, we're already seeing this in New York with the Restore Mother Earth Bond Act. We need to make sure that that passes and that is uh, funded so that we can start to uh, tackle some of the key uh, issues that are going to be coming forward um, and make sure that we fight uh, for climate justice for everyone. But part of this also is um, a perception issue. We, we see this in Portland and other rural communities where they hear the term Green New Deal and they think of um, a program that is outside of their day-to-day -day lives. And we really need to show people as leaders in Albany what this means to move our country forward, move our district forward, move our state forward as we battle the effects of climate change, what it really means to them. We've seen this, we've hit a touch point here with COVID-19 and the impact that it has. And we can really lead our state forward by showing them what a Green New Deal can mean for us as we really start to battle the biggest challenge of our lives, which is climate change. Thank you. Jordan Lesser, you're up next, followed by Lisa Hoschel. You have one minute. Yes, you know, I, I agree that uh, one of the main struggles here is the perception that government should not have 
a major seat at the table making this happen, that the best reforms in our society happen through market forces. Well, you know, we, we're here at this climate crisis because of market forces. Uh, we hear a lot of pledges from oil and gas companies. Oh, they're going to research uh, renewables. Oh, they're moving away from fossil fuels. We know for a fact that's not true. We know we're not going to reach our climate goals here in New York or anywhere across the world unless we have strong government action, strong regulation. And, you know, we don't see the public necessarily aligning with that. I think recently there's been more of a shift, but to every step forward we take, there are multiple, uh, you know, interested groups writing letters to the editor or having uh, disinformation campaigns pushing back against uh, the reality of the crisis we're facing. So in order to truly get there, uh, you know, first of all, we're, it's great that we live in New York because we have been able to take strong action that other states have not been able to. But I wanna work with the public, work with concerned uh, entities and advance the dialogue forward. Thank you, Jordan. Lisa, you are up, followed by Jason Liefer. You have one minute. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm from Hyde Park, New York, and FDR was always someone that I looked at with inspiration and, and with, with a reflective uh, viewpoint of what he did with a terrible crisis. And this is our opportunity to be bold. I was speaking with a constituent just before this forum who was concerned about runoff in the water, who was concerned about the things that we don't see in our land and air that are affecting our bodies and our, our, our we have an opportunity now to be bold in our thinking. We can't just walk away from the opportunity to really embrace what we can do, think big, think broad, and invest. Take the monies, for example, from a carbon tax, and let's invest them into our opportunities for technology growth in the green sector. Absolutely be bold when it comes to legislating around new construction and making sure that anything that's, that's being developed in terms of construction is green technology. Let's look at the grid and make sure that we're looking at it in terms of solar power, but we can't Thank just you, take the middle ground. We Jason, have to be bold. Jason, you are up, you're followed by Seth Murtaugh. Thank you. Um, I think what um, I found in the work I've done in Dryden already is that you really need to, to speak to people's motivations because when you use the term climate change, it, it's great in one crowd, but not in another. And the way we were able to get the solar farms approved and, you know, and accepted by the town is to appeal to people's different motivations. So on one hand, you had conservatives who were, uh, the appeal is that the, the money would raise for local government and possibly lower the taxes. And, and on the you know, folks on the environmental side, just like the idea of not using fossil fuels. Um, right now, fossil fuels are still the, probably the most convenient thing for people to use. Um, so what we need to do is change people, you know, help people change their behavior, let them know that um, you know, technology is their friend and, and get rid of the um, football team mentality have with, we have with these, with these, um, with these, with the language. Because I think that in the end, Everybody likes clean air and clean water and clean and you know safe land. They like clean food and they like uh, conservation because then nobody likes to waste anything. And in the end, it's going to just take a short change in culture and language to Thank get you, it. Jason. Seth Murtaugh, gear up, followed by Sujana. I think the biggest challenge uh, for moving forward the Green New Deal is the absolute financial onslaught that our state and local governments are facing as a result of this pandemic. And, you know, this isn't abstract to me. You know, a few weeks ago, I, as a member of the city of Ithaca Council, had to figure out with my colleagues how to furlough 87 employees. And I fought and fought successfully to retain our sustainability coordinator so he could continue the work of working on our green building code so we could push forward the city of Ithaca Green New Deal. And I really think that's what it comes down to. It's a question of priorities. There's a limited amount of funding to go around. And what are you going to prioritize? And I think we have to prioritize this because the truth is that climate change is the biggest existential threat that we face. Uh, so that's work that I've done at the local level, and it's work I will be more than willing to continue in Albany. Okay, I think there's two major hurdles. I agree that there is a, a the people's will, and then there's also the political will. So starting with the people's will, I think the way we uh, approach this is jobs. We just really, we are decimated economically. 
We need jobs, jobs, jobs. They need to be jobs that are building up infrastructure. And I think people will be on board and we can build that movement. Uh, for our political will, um, and of course, you know, just basically uh, taking care of each other by growing food and weatherizing our homes. For political will, that's going to be harder. This is a state that is very entrenched with corporate interests and um, trickle-down economics and moving towards pretty rapidly a, an austerity solution to getting us out of this situation. And we are going to need to ask them to put everything, totally reallocate how they do everything. So to do that, we are going to have to look at what happened with, uh, with the New Deal with FDR. And it wasn't just that he was a great legislator, it's because people were out having basically a revolution in the streets. And he had to do something, ra something radical to prevent an all-out revolution. And I think we need to get out in those streets and, and make that same pressure felt. Thank you. We are going to move now to the lightning round. Uh, I, this was touched on at the beginning of the forum, but these should be very short answers. You shouldn't answer and explain your answer. It should just be a one word answer. Uh, we were gonna continue to say, I don't, have you guys unmuted everybody when you did this previously or just gone person? Oh no, person? we've randomly rotated around and- That's we, not what I'm asking. Uh, Anna, mute, we that's mute not what I, That's not what I'm asking. <laughs> okay. I, we mute sometimes, sometimes they mute or unmute us for whatever it's, Worth. Yeah. Is anyone from NY? No, we have not done that. We had we rely on everyone to individually do that. But okay. So Anna, we're going to start with you again. Yeah. Uh, excited you are by that. Is a no, one word answer. What is your favorite park in the district? Stewart. Bo. Freeman. Jordan. Deganic. Lisa. Kayak Nyoka Falls. Jason. Tuganic. Seth? I don't know. Sujana. Tuganic. Great. Do you compost? Anna? Yes. Absolutely. Bo? No. Jordan? Every day. Lisa? Yes. Jason? Yes. Seth? No. Sujana? Yes, we have a compost business. Do you drive an electric car? Yes. No. Jordan? Uh, I do not. Lisa? I have a hybrid. Jason? No. Seth? I don't actually own a car. <laughs> Sujata? Yes. Great. That was a very successful first lightning round. We're going to revisit that again. <laughs> Question number four. We are going to reverse the order this time. So, Sujata, you're going to go first. Anna, you will go last. Well, either way. Question number four. Harmful algal blooms have been a problem across upstate New York and in Cayuga Lake specifically. What else do you think the state needs to do to address this issue? Sujata, you have one minute, followed by Seth. It's not popular, but we've got to do something about, uh, about the... Um, the runoff from the from the farms so we really have to figure something out that will support our farmers so that they're able to transition to a more sustainable method of farming that's not gonna you know cause so much runoff um, and we can do that we can support them so that they're not left out in the cold to, to kind of handle this all themselves but that's got to be number one priority um, in addition to that you know I do think there is there's different considerations but I do think that the sewage going right into the lake uh, as, as well as that may be working out, I don't think is a great strategy. I do think we need to incentivize things like composting toilets, which are actually getting pretty good. They're you know, to the point where they might be made into something that more people could get on board with, but at the very least we have to get rid of the regulations that make it really hard to do something like that. Because right now you have to put in a septic system and a composting toilet, so it doesn't incentivize these kinds of behaviors. Seth, you are up next, followed by Jason Leifer. So I think the big thing to tackle is, is the runoff into our watershed. And you know there are practices, best management practices that have been identified to do this. The challenge is that they can be extremely challenging for farmers to implement. In a lot of cases, these have widespread support. Farmers want to do them, but they can't do them. And so I think there needs to be more su support from the state, you know, perhaps through the Environmental Protection Fund or other programs, the Restore Mother 
earth bond that was passed recently uh, to help farmers uh, to implement these best management practices. You know, and I think another big piece of this is also making sure that we are upgrading our water systems, whether it's wastewater or drinking water systems uh, to prevent uh, pollution from getting into our lake. I think both of these things require a heavy state investment. Um, you know, I know that there have been uh, some good steps in recent years to upgrade water systems and to provide state funding for that, uh, but it's something we need to continue and I would definitely support a stronger commitment in that area. Thank you. Jason Lee for you're up next, followed by Lisa Hoshel. Um, so we need to do a lot of things. Um, one of the, you know, one was already touched on, the runoff from farms, but it's also places like golf courses. Um, but in conjunction with that, you need to work with local governments like towns and counties who actually maintain culverts, which all end up feeding into the lake. Um, there needs to be some work done on stream bank restoration. We need riparian buffers. Uh, a lot of these things are done by local governments and including stormwater control, which the state has never actually funded. Um, we, we pay for that ourselves, even though it's been a state mandate for years. Um, and I sit on the board of the Ithaca Area Wastewater Treatment Plant, and there um, we, they, we do things like have a, a, a digester system to turn waste and energy Farmers should have, be able to use that on their farms to, to control the waste from uh, their, their animals. Um, it's done in many places across the country, but you know, again, it comes down to money and if we're gonna invest in local farms and, and increasing uh, the energy supply on local grids, that's one great way to do it when you have a large dairy farm. Um, it, you know, instead of these big lagoons of waste, you can turn it into energy. Thank you. Lisa, you are up next, followed by Jordan Lesser. So, well, you know, Cayuga Lake and the lake to, lakes and the Finger Lakes are very, very important. We have to remember that one of the most important lakes that feed Portland County are, is underground. It's actually our watershed that's underground. And we've actually had to work very, very hard to make sure that we protect that through regulation and trying to keep um, the addition of, of gas stations and uh, big box stores from paving over uh, what could potentially be drainage for watershed. I think we have to continue to, to think about that. It's not just about the big blue lakes that you can see, but it's about the blue lakes that you can see underwater that really need to be protected. I also think about the New York City Watershed Whole Farm Program. I'm from downstate again. I, I, I live in, I, my father lived in the Osho, 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 Oshokan Reservoir area for a very long time. It feeds New York City. It keeps its water clean because it's incentivizing farmers against runoff and helping them remain organic in terms of making sure that their runoff, that, that they're not using fertilizer, and that a lot of the, the waste products is not going into the, the water system. I think those are the things we're focusing on. Jordan, you're up next, followed by Bo Harbin. One minute. Yes, yeah, so I've actually been Assembly Member Lifton's point person to the regional harmful algal bloom uh, uh, events across the state uh, held, held in Syracuse. And it's clear what we need to do. We need a TMDL report, total maximum daily load report from the DEC to be produced for Cayuga Lake. So we know exactly what's going in the lake, from where, when, and to what level to reduce the amount of contaminants and nutrients that are going into the lake. This is something that was supposed to have been completed in 2007. I've uh, raised it at several meetings and they'll, and they'll say, you know, oh, two weeks from now, oh, two months from now, you know, there's always a time frame. It's been 13 years, it hasn't happened yet. In Albany, I will press uh, the agency to make sure we have this document and we can move forward with a realistic plan. Uh, some of this would be encouraging soil health programs. There's a lot of great research at Cornell on this issue. Uh, you know, funding comes from the state and, and they know how to get it out to farms uh, through Cornell Cooperative Extension because soil health ends up uh, being water health. Thank you, Jordan. Bo, you're up next, followed by Anna. So in order to help prevent the algae blooms, we need to make sure that we uh, pass forward the Restore Mother Earth Bond Act, which has allocated funds uh, in there. Uh, for this issue, but I do take a little bit of uh, umbrage with uh, putting the blame on our farmers. They are under a significant amount of stress and we have not given them the support that they need. On my work on the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Portland County's board, I see this regularly. I work with farmers like um, Mike McMahon at Easy Acre Farms where he is leading the nation in 
sustainable ways to prevent runoff from his farms. He needs support. This is why we need to pass Assembly Bill 2283 to help fund digesters. And we need to make sure that we fund our soil and water districts. We've done this in Cortland County. I have led the fight in Cortland County to prevent the defunding of our soil and water district, which really helps provide the much needed expertise for our farmers and others to prevent uh, the runoff into our streams. Remember, part of our district not only goes to Cuga, but the other part goes into the Chesapeake Bay to the Tafneahoga down into the Susquehanna. So we need to fight on both sides of the district to help prevent this runoff. Thank you, Bo. Anna, you're up, one minute. Uh, so there are many things that we can do. I can't hit on all of them, but I will bring up three that I think are really important. The first is the Clean Water Infrastructure Act. Uh, we have put in um, 2.5 billion, another 500 million that just went in, but it needs 80 billion to upgrade our water and sewer infrastructure. Our uh, wastewater treatment plants, we know there's, outflow, there's inflow and outflow issues that are contaminating our waterways, that's one thing that is contributing that needs to be reduced. A second thing is regenerative agriculture. Investments in regenerative agriculture, a fund already exists, we can invest in that. We know that that will increase the quality of the soil with no-till, crop rotation, um, surface coverage 100% uh, of the time. Those practices we know will decrease the runoff into the, the waterways. The third is technology. There is a technology that is being created right here locally in this area, um, in, and it's called pyrolysis units, which we know you can take manure, you can take different organic matter, put that into the pyrolysis unit, they're modular units, and that will create energy biochar that can go into the soil as well as electricity. So great jobs, Thank you, great Anna. resource. All right. Uh, as you guys know, New York is a very diverse state. We have one of the densest urban areas on the planet in New York City, and we also have a large swath of sprawling rural. So a one-size-fits-all policy is not gonna work as far as transportation across the state. But what do you think needs to be done to reduce, em reduce emissions for the transportation sector in New York State, and what would you do as an assembly person to address that? We are going to go in the same reverse order. We're gonna start with Suja Sujata again. You have one minute. Okay, so I think, you know, yeah, downstate and upstate are pretty different. I like the congestion pricing. I think we do need to look at uh, clean, uh, clean transportation bills. Uh, and there are a number of good ones out there with fuel emission standards and incentive programs. Um, I, we might want to look at other things too, though, like, um, uh, you know, reducing the work week, which will have benefits beyond that too, but there's a bill out there to reduce the work week to four days a week. I think uh, that might be interesting to see if that would uh, that would reduce emissions. And as I've said before, I'm I'm interested in finding ways to create neighborhoods that are more rural based and but still not sprawled out. So like the eco village model, but with an affordable housing component, one that we can maybe work towards where families can be supported and grow food and have more sustainable lifestyles, but really do a lot of it right there at home and not have to drive so much. So I think that that is a solution that I'd be interested in looking at more um, out of time. Thank, Thank you. you. Seth Murtaugh, you're up next, followed by Jason Leifer. I think we have to do more to really focus and uh, bolster up our rural public transportation system. So whenever uh, you know transportation is discussed in Albany, it's always divided between downstate and upstate. You have the MTA downstate. And our rural systems tend to get lumped in with these larger upstate transportation authorities that service big cities or suburbs. And the problem with that is that they're not getting enough attention because they have really unique needs. Um, this is something I've worked on in Assemblywoman Barbara Lipton's office with the non-emergency Medicaid transportation issue in Cortland. You know, there was some, a few years back, there were some Medicaid cuts that resulted in some public transportation systems even shutting down, big cutbacks to public transportation. The result is that more and more people are having to get the medical appointments by taxis. Uh, there's a real need for concentrated funding in those areas to hold up those uh, public transit systems and I also think there's a need for coordination. You know, there was a few years ago, there was a big push on this. In fact, uh, Barbara Lifton was a big leader on this um, to get a uh, coordinating council written into the transportation law. As far as I know, that council's never met. It doesn't even have a, a charge. So that's something. Thank you, Jason, you're up followed by Lisa Hoschel. 
And so we have a couple of things we can and we, we already are doing in Dryden. One of them is building rail trails for transportation. And people don't need to drive cars to go to work. They can take their bike. A lot of folks in Dryden uh, do that. And we've been pretty successful in getting a lot of grant money for that. So uh, I, I definitely would continue funding that statewide. Um, broadband so that people can telecommute or do telemedicine. I think Lisa mentioned that earlier and it's, it's a no-brainer. It stops people from even having to drive. Um, can continue the Climate Smart Community Program so that people can take advantage of um, building EV charging stations. The more of those stations you have, the more people will buy electric vehicles. That's really the, been the biggest impediment. If people don't think it's convenient. They don't think they're going to be able to um, get to and from wherever they're going because they can't refuel. Um, nodal development, it's something that's in our town comprehensive plan. It's, it's in the, the county's planning and, you know, the county's comprehensive plan, it's something that needs to be, there needs to be more of it done because when you have that, you can have uh, public transportation, getting people to and from wherever they're going. Thank you. Lisa Hoshul, you're up, followed by Jordan Lesser. So first of all, I think, you know, 40% of investments in clean energy should absolutely be going back into disadvantaged communities. And that may also mean rural communities, not just urban communities. I think it's very important that we recognize that, you know, it's interesting what Seth just said about Medicaid supporting public transportation. What are we using Medicaid dollars for when it comes to transportation, when we should be investing in transportation as transportation? That tells you about our priorities. This is about a will to do what needs to be done. We have the money, we have had the money, we have chosen not to invest it where we need to invest it. To Jason's point, absolutely more broadband. To Sujata's point, a four day work week. How about car sharing opportunities? We need to use funds to incentivize new programming and not just go back to where we were, but move forward at this time of crisis and use this time of crisis to think bigger picture. What's working right now under COVID that we can continue to allow to occur that will allow our environment to survive? That's where we need to be bold and passionate. Jordan Lesser, you are up next, followed by Bo Harbin. You got one minute. Yes, you know, the way I see it, there are three types of transportation we need to work on. Uh, first of all is, uh, commuting, daily commuting. So what we need to do here is make sure we have more walkable, bikeable communities. We need to invest in upstate transit and under the Volkswagen settlement, thankfully here in Tompkins, we've been able to roll out a lot of uh, uh, electric buses recently. You know, we need to not rely just on the malfeasance of a company to get that money. We need to use, uh, you know, revenue, I believe raised from a carbon fee to pay for this kind of initiative going forward. Secondly, you know, we can't get from here to Albany very simply on any public transportation. We have to go and sit in uh, Syracuse for a couple hours on a bus. I would call for increased rail service across the state. You know, we're, we lag very far behind many other countries in terms of what uh, the accessibility of our public, uh, you know, infrastructure and, and how we can travel on uh, mass transit. Thirdly, you know, we have so many airports across the state, upstate airports. If we put in high-speed rail or, frankly, any rail service at all, we wouldn't be flying from here to New York City and Buffalo and, you know, pointless small trips all the time. Thanks. Bo, you are up next, followed by Anna. Sure. So, you know, downstate, I would definitely support the congestion pricing. We've seen this work in other global um, urban centers such as London to help decrease um, the, carb the uh, emissions there. Um, and then working with them downstate, I want them to understand some of the issues that we face upstate. And I do this in working with the Democratic Rural Caucus um, and Conference um, here to bring together our rural uh, communities to say, what, are, what more can we do? I like uh, Jordan's uh, idea of rail system. I think we need a better uh, rail network. Uh, that is gonna be an, an investment that uh, is gonna be long-term and we're gonna need federal dollars. What we do locally here though, is we need to knit our, our communities together better. I've led the fight to help protect here in Cortland County, our public transportation system. We have, it has always been under the microscope to defund and, and eliminate, um, but it is so vital for uh, our disadvantaged individuals to get to the jobs that they need to. We need to look to expand that. We need to expand those uh, opportunities to knit these smaller communities in our counties together. We need to also continue that with our rails and trail system. 
Thank you, Bo. Anna, you are last up. Yeah, so I'm quite passionate about the upstate high-speed rail myself. Um, did a study with a graduate student at Cornell. It turns out it'll be over $60 billion. So I'm certainly interested. We'd love to see that continue. Um, some things in the short term I'd love to see happen are uh, low carbon fuel standard um, and also taxing dirty fuels that can pay for our zero, uh, zero carbon um, transportation infrastructure and vehicles. Um, some of the things that I've talked about, the infrastructure build out for, um, for electric vehicles, that is absolutely critical and something we can do right away. Um, there are other things that are really important, I think, it's particularly in more rural areas, um, and that is support for how we all get around, like tra tra transportation demand management and mobility as a service, so that we support multimodal different types of transportation that individuals can take to get to urban and rural areas and really support rural areas. Um, I think that is absolutely critical. And invest in our public transportation system. We have not done that as much as we should and need to, and that is something I would focus on. Thank you. All right, I think the success of the first one, we're moving into the second lightning round. Uh, we are gonna keep this reverse order, like we did the first one, we're just gonna do it backwards and then we will randomize as we go into audience questions, which are up after this lightning round. So let's try to keep it to very brief answers. Everybody did really good the first time, so. We're gonna start with Sujata. What is the most promising renewable energy source? I love hydropower. I love the things we can do with water. Seth. I agree with Sujata, I think hydropower. Jason. Solar. Lisa. Solar. Jordan. It's clearly geothermal for all of our homes. Oh, that's Bob. a good one. Solar. Anna. I agree with geothermal. Question two, back to Sujata. Do you bring reusable bags when you go shopping? Most of the time. Seth. Yes, always. Jason. Jason? Yes. Lisa? Mine have little animals on them every single time, and if I don't have it, I carry them out in my arms. Jordan? Yes, and I was glad to support the plastic bag ban uh, oh. last year. Absolutely. Anna. Always, and carry in my arms too if I forget. The final lightning round question, do you carry a reusable water bottle? Sujata? Yes. Seth? I don't really carry a water bottle, but I have a mug for coffee. Jason? I don't carry a water bottle. I just I have, I have things in my office. So. Lisa? Absolutely. I hate that plastic crap. Jordan? Absolutely. Bo? Everyone in the family does. Anna. Always or a mug. All right, people took some liberties with the second lightning round, but everybody kept it brief. <laughs> uh, we're gonna now move to audience questions, read by Julie. Yes, and thank you. Thank you all for keeping those lightning round questions lightning round. Uh, younger people have become more active in the fight against climate change in recent years. How would you engage the youth or college students in environmental issues? Obviously very pertinent in Ithaca. All right, we are gonna start with Seth, followed by Lisa. I mean, so we've had examples of this locally with the Sunrise Movement, um, who came out to lobby us, uh, I think it was two budgets ago, in favor of the, the Green New Deal. And it was a, it was a tricky budget, because we were, we were also dealing with some um, you know, cutbacks with the fire department. And so we had to make some choices. And I think having um, all the, the young members of the, the Green New, the Sunrise Movement there uh, to speak out in public. It definitely did shift our thinking on it and we ended up funding it. Um, the second thing I can think of is uh, some, other, some other members of the Sunrise Movement who helped uh, push the city uh, to, to adopt accessory dwelling units to expand infill housing. Um, that's an issue I dealt with as chair of the Planning and Economic Development Committee. Um, you know, it was a very tough, contentious battle. But I was really pleased that the students were able to come out uh, to month after month of these meetings and voice their concerns because too often they're left out of those conversations, especially in a place like Ithaca, you know, where it's oftentimes older homeowners who are the ones who show up to these meetings month after month and whose voices are the loudest. Lisa, you are up followed by Anna Kells. So please don't take this the wrong way, but we have two college communities here. We have Cortland, we have Tompkins, and we have um, 
Ithaca, we have Ithaca uh, College, but we have Cortland, SUNY Cortland, we have two seats. So there are a number of young people that can be engaged in this. So Ithaca is not the only area that's impacted when it comes to thinking about the environment. I think it's really important that we remember that. How about we engage those young people in letting them understand just how much waste is occurring on their own college campuses. I live on the Cortland campus. I see every winter when I walk my dog the amount of salt that's being thrown around the sidewalks when the college isn't even in session. I see lights on 24 seven. I see computers on all the time. I think that really engaging those folks and letting them understand where their communities, their college communities are impacting the environment negatively is very, very important. I also really firmly believe we should be lowering the voting age. These younger people have a better view of their futures than we do. It's time for us to support them, help them, let younger people engage. They're smarter than we are. Thank you, Lisa. Anna, you were up, followed by Jordan Lesser. First, I just want to say, Lisa, yes, absolutely, voting age. That's crazy. But the second thing I really want to say is, um, actually, students know a lot. I should, I, we really shouldn't assume right. that they don't. So right. I think it's really right. important that we include them in policy creation. They're at the table. Um, we have at the county just started a, a climate action um, and, and sustainable energy task force. And we have students on that task force um, that you write policies with students. I had an intern this last year and she helped me work for six months on my housing policy. Um, so I think it's partnering, it's working with, it's listening to, debating, um, uh, those are the most important, I think, aspects, but also showing up. Um, for me, I'm a teacher, so uh, the most important thing is engaged learning, um, that you argue it, you debate it, you search for answers, and I think that those are really important and create an understanding that's much more global. Finally, I think it's really important for us to understand that our experience um, as older generations, um, we didn't grow up in climate change. A lot of the students have lived it every moment of their lives. And Thank you, Anna. That's really important. Jordan, you are up next, followed by Sujata. Yeah, you know, when I look around and see who's really leading this movement across the globe, I'm not sure anyone, you know, the youth needs me to really uh, take their hand and move them forward. We have Greta Thunberg clearly uh, shaking up, you know, the, the climate change debate across the globe. This is coming from a youth movement, I see that a lot of people, a lot of students across uh, our district and across the state have worked to take up that mantle. But what I would like to do is make sure that you know, they understand what it takes to get something done in Albany. We need to have a concerted, repeated uh, mm -hmm. visit of students who care about climate coming to Albany day after day, coming to uh, hearings, NCON hearings, meeting with the governor's office, holding rallies on the million dollar staircase in Albany. I've been there for 10 years. I know exactly what it takes to get it done. Uh, this can't just be an email campaign. It can't be a casual thing. You do it once. You meet with a group of students once. They come once. They need to come every month, every week. And this is exactly what I would work with, you know, interested groups to make sure it happens and we get real change in Albany. Thank you, Jordan. Sujata, you are up followed by Jason Leifer. Well, I'd be bringing the kids to Albany too. I think it would be a great way to uh, advance the cause and it should be a regular standing, uh, standing arrangement. It would be great to bring uh, in farming and environmental sustainability into the schools. That's a big part of my platform with the Green New Deal. I think that kids should be learning how to grow food, keep food, use food, and, uh, and have all the tools so that we can have food sovereignty. And that helps, uh, you know, learn about environmental stewardship in a lot of ways once you have that connection. Um, but it would be also nice to have kind of a component of schools be that uh, students could, could come feel uh, very welcome and engaged in the process in Albany and it would be great to make uh, opportunities for that and I would be very much an open door for that um, and brainstorming how to do that. The, uh, the youth of today are engaged. I'd like to find ways to give them hope uh, to get them involved in a way that it's, um, you know, it's a quite a frightening time to be a young person. I, I know that when I was young, I was like a Cassandra, um, but, but they're really facing it. <laughs> Jason, you are up. Bo Harbin, you will finish us out on question one. Um, so some of the things that I've actually done um, is 
go speak to kids in fourth grade um, when my son was at the Bell Sherman and actually teach them about why it's important to participate in local government. And, and you know, they were, they were fantastic to talk to because they, they asked exactly what we did. And, and that way I was able to tell them why it's important to participate on things like, you know, planning boards and, and uh, conservation boards. And, and, and then in, um, what that have, ends up happening is that the kids are encouraged to join things like say at the Whit Middle School where they have a, a, a gardening club. But in Dryden, there's a sustainability clubs throughout the uh, middle school, the high school. Um, and I remember specifically from the time we were banning fracking that you know, there were a lot of parents who brought their kids to that hear those hearings. And, and there were parents who brought their kids to the hearings for the solar reforms. Um, and bringing your children and engaging them early makes them continue on. And, and one thing I did with my own kids I was lucky enough this past summer to go to Germany where they could actually see firsthand what a country who takes sustainability and environmental protection seriously looks like. And they could witness um, thank you, Jason. everything that, that they do. So thank you. Bo, close us out. You got one minute. So this is something I've been very uh, passionate about because the district that I represent on the legislature includes a, mat, a big chunk of SUNY Cortland. Um, I was invited by the SUNY Cortland Institute of Civic Engagement to come and participate in a number of forums that they put on to help increase uh, participation. And it was great to really be able to work with students to see their passion, to understand, and just to provide, listen to what they had to say and provide some leadership, to provide them some direction as to where to go. This has uh, allowed us to create a Climate Smart Task Force, which combines town and gown together to work together to help move Cortland forward on our climate smart initiatives, both in the city and in the county. Um, and we've been able to move these things, uh, move these things forward because they have such a passion for uh, the, the future of their city, their community, and their state. The other thing that we, I've been looking to do and been active on is recruiting young candidates for office. Uh, get them into the, the political process early, help them through that process, lead them through that process, because they're going to be their future, and my experience can help them uh, come along. Thank you, Bo. Now back to Julie for question two from the audience. Great, and I'm, I apologize to Cortland. That was not a slight. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's cool. I, I even went to soccer camp there when I was a kid. Just saying, no. <laughs> Um, all right, we're going to make this next question be a 30 second question because it's pretty, I think you can, you should be able to answer it in a pretty abbreviated manner. So got that Claire? All right. Have you ever taken part in a public demonstration for environmental issues and if so, which issues? We are going to start with Jordan Lesser followed by Bo Harbin. Yep. Uh, yes, I have for climate change repeatedly in Albany, in New York City, the National Climate March with uh, Al Gore and other climate leaders. You know, I've looked to that example that we're not never going to uh, achieve change unless we do take to the streets. I, unfortunately, I feel like we've lost a little bit of momentum in recent years. You know, no, no one's out there marching, I guess, given what's going on at the federal level, it's hard to, you know, we'd be marching every second of every day. But uh, yes, it's something I believe in strongly. You know, we need to play both inside and outside uh, strategies to get to our goals. Bo, you're up. Followed by Anna Kells. And I, I recognize my strength is not necessarily uh, walking the street and, and protesting. Um, I like to uh, help move uh, opinion forward, but I have taken a, a part in an environmental protest. Many of you won't remember, but uh, when I was living in Virginia, back in the 90s, uh, Disney World wanted to come in and bulldoze over one of our national parks, or at least part of our national park. And as a trained historian and a Virginian uh, by upbringing, that really uh, influenced me. And that was one of my opportunities to get out and walk the street to say, no, big business has no, bu no building, uh, no future in our uh, building uh, in Virginia. Thank you, Bo. Anna, you are up, followed by Jason Liefer. Uh, so I've been a part of many marches down in um, downtown area. Um, I've spoken at several of them. Uh, I would say the, the most um, emotional for me, there was the first one where I was with a group of farmers and food activists and food um, as a nutrition person, as someone who works in agriculture. I, and previously, um, I uh, was at uh, Crestwood Seneca Lake to get arrested to block Crestwood from expanding natural gas under the lake. Um, was then again with mothers uh, 
on Mother's Day and we were arrested, which was a quite an intense experience, but ultimately mm -hmm. um, they did not expand natural gas because of a lot of the work we were doing over several years. Uh, Jason Leifer, you are up next, followed by Sujata. Um, well, being Ithaca, <laughs> I think it's been uh, like, you know, maybe going to an Earth Day, you know, function, but the thing, it wasn't really much of a protest, but it was more of a celebration when we got the decision on the uh, appeal on the fracking ban in Dryden. Um, and I spoke at that, you know, you know, thanking all the local activists and activists from all around the region who helped make that happen. Um, and other than that, my, I, my activity has really been every time I do I go through a campaign door to door, environmental issues are always at the top of the list. And uh, that, that's how I uh, get things done in, in Dryden. Sujata, you are up, followed by Lisa Hoshal. Literally hundreds of times. Um, you know, with, with We Are Seneca Lake, I, I, I practically lived out at Crestwood. Um, I was there the day that fracking was banned. I have been told that, I'm a, that I, I better watch my back when I go to Schuyler County because people have it out for me uh, for, how many, for how much work I did out there on that. I, I've worked with the Extinction Rebellion on uh, protests against Chase Bank and, and other uh, activities. I've been out in the streets. I've been working for indigenous uh, environmental uh, issues and protests. I was just recently protesting 5G, which I have a panel on right after this. Come join me. Thank you. Lisa, you are up. Seth, so, you are up. You know, somebody said earlier, this is a recent, you know, experience when it comes to climate change. When my husband and I, remember I'm old, I have COVID here. Um, my husband and I got married 35, I don't know, 34, 33 years ago. At our wedding, instead of gifts, we asked people to sign a petition for um, recyclable plastics because we were so concerned about the environment that as we were having our reception, we didn't want gifts. We wanted money and signatures on a petition to make sure that we could work on getting plastics out of the environment. I've worked very hard with PlasticTides.org and have been at their events. And I think you should go to PlasticTides.org because they've done a lot of work around you, uh, the Finger Lakes area. Steph, you are up. So most of my activities have been focused around downtown Ithaca. That's the ward I represent on council. And like Anna, there's a lot of public demonstrations and, you know, I'm the city's alternate acting mayor. So I've occasionally stood in for the mayor when he's out of town um, to speak at functions. I'm, the one that really stands out to me actually um, was just last summer. And that was the sunrise rally that happened on the commons. I thought that was a really memorable moment. Um, it was incredible just to see the number of people, but also what was incredible was to see the different ages. Um, that there were the young people were obviously the ones who were leading it and um, and the older people were there to support them. I thought it was a it was a great moment. Great. All right, we are going to move to wrap up statements. You each have 30 seconds to wrap up anything is you would like to say to the people. We are going to start with Jordan Lesser. All right, everyone, you know, I think my record shows that my commitment and my expertise has been crucial to accomplishing many uh, significant success after success for the environment in New York State for my 10 years working in the legislature. You know, we're entering a critical time for our environment. Uh, climate change, yes, an existential, existential crisis. Now is not the time to assume that, that this background and experience and relationships can be uh, the same no matter who goes to Albany. I think we'd be making a mistake to send someone there who doesn't know how to do ready. And I'm your best environmental candidate. Sujata, you are up, followed by Anna Kells. Well, I have experience uh, you know, making legislation in Albany, working with lobbyists, legislators, and others to get environmental things passed. But right now we are at a critical time. We need a sea change, a massive sea change. And that is what I do best. I've been working for change my whole life. I've been in the union movement. I've been on the front lines of the environmental movement. I've grown, helped grow the environmental movement. Um, you know, this is, uh, along with so many others, I'm ready to go there with the thousands of people who this is crucial to at my back and make change uh, the way I know how, the way I, I know how from teaching uh, at Cornell, and I'm excited to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Anna Kells, you will be followed by Jason Leifer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm an environmentalist, been my whole life, an activist, an educator, a policymaker. Um, I have been doing this work 
as I said, my entire life, I am dedicated to do it. I know um, what needs to be done. I have a plan for what needs to be done. I've also governed for both urban and rural environments. I understand the issues of both of them. That's very important. I've also gotten in the last uh, couple months endorsements from some of the biggest names in climate um, in the climate community here from Dr. Bob Howarth and Tony Ingraffia who have been working with me. I have a town hall with them next week on June 5th at 7 p.m. So I hope everybody will tune in. Thank you. Right. Jason Leifer, you will be followed by Bo Harbin. Yeah, so I've been uh, talking the talk and walking the walk my entire career in, in public. Um, I've gotten, I, I have shepherded projects through and, and talk, tackled the big issues um, before, you know, many of the folks here even talked about it. Um, the thing is in Albany, I, I am ready to hit the ground running. I work with communities. I work, I know how the, to get these things done, like renewable energy, you need to have knowledge of local government to make it happen. And of anyone here, I have the most knowledge of rural local government. Um, so when we are building what we need to tackle the uh, state's climate change goals, I will be able to get it done. Thank you. Bo, you are up next, followed by Lisa. I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity to come and speak with you today. I just want to leave you with, um, you know, a lot of what we've heard about today from, from others um, are successes that they've uh, been able to accomplish in majority uh, communities that uh, the natural support is there. But I want to remind you that in Cortland County, I'm a minority leader and I've been able to get a lot done, to be able to move forward climate smart initiatives and other renewable energy projects within our uh, minority community so that we can lead our district. Um, I have a proven, principled and progressive track record that I will bring to Albany. Lisa, you are up next, followed by Seth. So the bottom line is it's not what I've done, it's what I can do. I have created coalitions throughout the state to make positive change in all the communities that we work with. I think that it's very important that the person who walks through the doors and the assemblies with this election is somebody who can lead with humor, lead with passion, and take bold steps to make change. Again, I look to FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt, Anna, to your point, uh, as somebody who's funded your, your campaign, as leaders, we need to be bold. And I don't think it matters what I've done. I think it matters what I can do. I can do whatever we need to do for our community. Thank you, Lisa. Seth Murtaugh, bring us home. So I wanna thank everyone for this opportunity to speak tonight. Um, you know, I have a strong track record of delivering results at the local level that really make a difference in people's lives. You know, I was part of a uh, sidewalk task force that drafted a new sidewalk law in the city of Ithaca that's resulted in five miles of new and improved sidewalk while spreading the costs out more equitably across the community. I fought for smart growth policies, change zoning to encourage more infill housing. I fought for bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure to make our streets safer for families. Uh, and I'm ready to bring all of these experiences and this ability to work effectively with others to Albany. So I, I would vote for your vote on, uh, in the June primary. Thank you very much. I just want to take a minute to thank NYLCV for having me. You can find me and all our reporting at IthacaVoice.com or Ithaca Voice on Facebook, and I will kick it back to Julie to wrap things up. Great. Thank you so much all for being here tonight. Um, we hope you learned a few new things about the environment, about our candidates. If you tuned in late or want to rewatch, this video will also be on our Facebook page at Facebook.com backslash NYLCV and our YouTube page at YouTube.com slash NYLCV. Uh, most importantly, be sure to vote. Early voting starts on June 13th and primary day is on June 23rd. You can also vote from home this year. Governor Cuomo signed an executive order requiring ballot applications to be automatically mailed to all voters for the primary election. I know I've got mine. I've already mailed mine in requesting an absentee ballot. Um, it would allow you to do voting by mail if you would prefer not to go to the poll in light of the difficult public health crisis we face. We hope that you enjoyed this tonight. We ask that you follow us on at NYLCV uh, for Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for updates. And if you haven't, if you're not already on our email list, please sign up at www.nylcv.org. Thank you again to everyone. I we hope that you all are staying safe and healthy out there. And have a good night. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Everyone. Good night. Thank you.